on today's show. For 10 days, family and friends waited and prayed. On Good Friday, doctors sat Dwayne down. He told us that without divine intervention, there was no chance that Natalie was not going to probably ever wake up. And he said, I want to meet back with you on Monday. And he said, at that point, he said, I want you to think about taking her off of life support. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laurel Lynn Tyler Thompson. It is great to be with you. Mm -hmm. We're so glad that you've chosen to spend this special time with mm -hmm. us as we remember and celebrate Good Friday. Mm. Well, you know, Brian, without the resurrection, everything that we do here is actually for no reason. If there was no resurrection, I was recently telling a friend, if you don't understand who Jesus was, that he came and he was born, but he died yes. and he was resurrected, yes. then everything that we do has no bearing. Well, and you're, you're absolutely right. And you know, one of my favorite memories, and uh, so many people today struggle whether we should celebrate Jesus' birthday. You know, they mm. talk about Christmas. Right, but if right. he was not born, he could not die. Mm. And there's some time we've got to celebrate that birth. I remember when I was a little kid and we had our Easter story and my mom, and mm. She didn't know I had an Easter speech. I've shared it before, but I stepped up, and I, I couldn't have been more than maybe about seven years old, and I said, come walk the streets of Calvary where once our Savior died. Come view the place of sadness where he was crucified. After the terrible trail of agony had last passed, we still could not find him. So let us lift our eyes to heaven, for there's where we will find his throne. Let us wow. worship him and rest and work and pray. Amen. Mm. Amen. The whole church just <laughs> went, what, what? <laughs> and it just blew up. Wow, and they said, that right. boy going to be a preacher. <laughs> and they were right. <laughs> and wow. look at him now. Right. You know, as we continue the theme of Easter, we have a special CBN news story with an eyewitness testimony that will help you never to doubt the resurrection again. Mm. Take a look at that. the events around that first Easter, you pretty much have to believe that Jesus did indeed exist and that the New Testament can be trusted. Biblical scholar Jonathan Merrow. The fact is we have far more sources for Jesus of Nazareth than we do for many historical figures in the first century as well. We have at least 18. Twelve of those are non-Christian sources. As for the New Testament, these books are the best attested pieces of ancient literature we possess. Dallas Theological Seminary's Daryl Bach says the Bible has far more ancient pages surviving than any other book from antiquity. It's exceptional. You're talking about 50, over 5,800 Greek manuscripts, over 8,000 Latin manuscripts. Most books that we work with in the ancient world have maybe at best a dozen manuscripts. For some, the biggest barrier to faith is believing that Jesus Christ could really have risen from the dead. But Mero says everything hangs on that. Paul made the argument in 1 Corinthians 15, he's like, look, you can test this. If the resurrection didn't happen, Christianity is false. It's, whether you believe it or not, whether you're sincere about it, if the resurrection didn't happen, Christianity is false, go to the next religion. But Christian experts say that to dismiss the resurrection, any theory you come up with to explain the historical happenings has to explain three historical facts. That there was an empty tomb three days after Jesus' body had been placed in it. He appeared to hundreds of people in numerous places for almost seven weeks after his crucifixion. And something huge happened to turn all the cowering, cowardly disciples into bold believers proclaiming a risen Messiah they were willing to be tortured and die for. Some suggest that the apostles all lied, a vast conspiracy theory to turn the deficit of his death into the positive of a risen Lord. But apologists like Daryl Bach here in Dallas point out that when you look at it all the way through, it's actually easier to believe in the resurrection than its alternatives. Some suggest the female disciples who first found the empty tomb might have just had the wrong tomb. But surely the Jewish leaders who'd had Roman guards placed by Jesus' burial place and Joseph of Arimathea who owned the tomb where Jesus was would have quickly corrected that mistake. If you're going around preaching Jesus was physically raised from the dead and people knew where he was buried and knew where they could find his bones, that 
message wouldn't even get off the ground. A leading biblical apologist, Josh McDowell, says these disciples knew this. In the resurrection, where it was the hardest place in the world to convince anyone it was true if it was false? Jerusalem, where a 15-minute walk by anyone could confirm the emptiness of the tomb. And then they said, you were there, you saw it. Matthew 28 points out the Jewish leaders bribed the tomb's guards to say that they'd fallen asleep and the disciples then stole Jesus' body. But if they were asleep, how would they know it was the disciples? And if the disciples were making up Jesus' resurrection, would they have lived and died for him and a fiction they themselves made up? And if they knew it, then you'd have to say, here were these men who not only died for a lie, but they knew it was a lie. I challenge you to find others in history that it's true of. It's not. You don't die knowingly for something that you know you made up. Uh, you, you would back off, and, and that didn't happen either. These and other experts say that in truth, it takes something as radical as Jesus' resurrection to so completely transform cowardly Peter, who was so scared just before the crucifixion, he swore he didn't even know Jesus. And then you see Peter with this radical transformation going from coward to this courageous champion who's saying, look, here I stand, this is what I'm saying, this is what's true. Merrill points out Jesus' brother James was also instantly changed. James, the brother of Jesus, didn't follow Jesus during his earthly ministry, he thought he was crazy. James despised his brother, thought he was embarrassing the family, everything. And then Jesus appeared to him in James' own word, and he became the leader of the church of Jerusalem. And then after the fact, James becomes an early leader in the, in the, in the church and was persecuted and eventually killed for that belief. And apologists say it could only be a resurrected Jesus showing up two or three years later that could transform the church's worst persecutor into its main missionary. Saul of Tarsus was anything but a follower believed in Jesus. He went from city to city, casting his vote to have him imprisoned and executed. But in his own words, Christ appeared to him. So the main thing is, is just explaining, you know, how someone like, any, like a, a Saul who becomes Paul even exists. He was holding the coat when people were killing the first Christians. He was adamantly opposed to this movement, and then he became a Christian. What accounts for that? The greatest murders into one of the greatest missionaries, to a Christian hater, to a Christian lover. Something happened in Paul's life that I've never found any other explanation that it even comes close to satisfying me intellectually except, and Jesus appeared to Paul after the resurrection. The first century Jews believed women were second-class citizens. So if the disciples were lying about the resurrection, they made their story all the harder to accept by putting women at the forefront. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all recount Jesus' earliest women followers finding the empty tomb. Now that's never that in the first century where a woman's testimony would have been about the level of just above a slave, that would not be your best foot forward. You never make up a story that way. This is what's called the criterion of embarrassment in historical Jesus studies, that you would never make up the story this way. So the reason the story is this way is because it must be grounded in what happened. Saying the disciples lied about Jesus' resurrection doesn't explain his appearance before 500 people. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 suggested doubters go talk to them. You've got living history. You've got the people who were there to cross-check whatever message is being there. So it's not as though that these things could have been invented and no one would have challenged it. You've got this idea that there's witnesses, go investigate them. It has all the ring of truth and, and not the ring of that conspiracy theory where they just made this thing up to invent their own religion. A lot of people then say, well, the appearances of Jesus were hallucinations. 500 people one time. McDowell studied the research on hallucinations, which shows they're not triggered by anything external, so no two people ever have the same hallucination. Because it's all internal, subjective. Would it have 500 people have the same hallucination? Paul would be 500 miracles equal to the resurrection. But Mero does say to accept the resurrection, you do have to believe in God. But if it's at least possible that God exists, then miracles become possible. And when you look at the resurrection evidence, it's pretty remarkable how strong it is. And that's why it's at the core of Christianity. But it's not a blind faith kind of thing, like believing in the Easter bunny or a lucky rabbit's foot. Christians don't believe that Jesus rose from the dead because the Bible says so. They believe he rose from the dead because that's what the earliest and best historical documents show. And that's what's the best explanation of the data. Paul Strand, CBN News. Wow, Laura Lynn, that's some powerful stuff. Yes, it really is. You know, 
Uh, I remember reading that book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, and yes. how Josh McDowell, you know, he went through all of the, the first-hand accounts mm -hmm. of the resurrection of Jesus and all of the things that had to take place, the body never being found, you know, uh, the, the disciples, I mean, literally 10 of them, I believe, that went to their death declaring that Jesus Absolutely. was who he said he was. Why? Because they experienced the resurrection. They saw him heal the people. They were so convinced of who Jesus was and they were his closest people that yeah. they gave their lives for that. Well, you know, and I think that is the ultimate. You can doubt a lot of facts and figures, but you cannot doubt a testimony mm. of a life that has been changed. Right. And you know, when you look at what actually took place with uh, Peter saying, I want to be crucified upside down because I'm not worthy to be crucified. Right. Uh, you know, That's how he died. Even as I see that, you know, mm. um, I guess the older that I get and the closer to heaven that I get, I, I begin to, you know, say, God, um, I'm not worthy. But uh, if you'll allow me, and I know in Canada right now, we need that type of conviction. And that's why this weekend is so mm. important for us that we refocus ourselves on the cross, mm. but also on Resurrection Sunday, because mm. the good news is the bad news is not true. Mm, that's so good, Brian. You know, I, I love that we're not the only ones who've experienced the power of God at work in our lives. That's for sure. And Natalie Elder's story is proof after the break. Mm. All of a sudden, everything starts to let go. The ledge and everything. Right when I realized that I was buried, I knew I was gonna die. So I just cried out to God, said, God, what do I do? And I heard him just as loud as you're talking to me, go find your brother. See miraculous stories like this in Answered Prayer. Pat Robertson's latest teaching uncovers the keys to help you get results, break down barriers, and build dynamic faith to receive your Answered Prayer. Available now. Rain pounded the windshield as Natalie Elders dropped her daughter off at school on April 10, 2003. Her husband, Dwayne, left earlier to open the family convenience store for the day. Then, his phone rang. Natalie had been T-boned by a pickup truck. The car had been hit bad and knocked back against the guardrail. I was looking for Natalie, of course, and Natalie was, they'd already got her out of the car. She was in the ambulance and the paramedics were working with her at the time. They, uh, she was lifeless. The local hospital couldn't handle Natalie's multiple trauma injuries so the family followed the ambulance to nearby Asheville, North Carolina. At first, the doctor was hopeful. He said she's in a coma, but she, he thought she would wake up within 24 hours. She didn't wake up at 24 hours. She didn't wake up at 36 hours. An MRI showed Natalie's brainstem was almost completely severed. If she ever woke up, she would be a lifetime quadriplegic. My faith in God was, was the only thing I had. On the day of Pentecost, though, uh, God sent us the comforter. And uh, that's pretty much what I had. For 10 days, family and friends waited and prayed. On Good Friday, doctors sat Dwayne down. He told us that without divine intervention, there was no chance that Natalie was not going to probably ever wake up. And he said, I want to meet back with you on Monday. And he said, at that point, he said, I want you to think about taking her off of life support. I guess in my mind, I thought it was pretty well over. We was going to have to make a decision Monday. And at that point, I said, God, boy, it sure would be nice to have a miracle performed. I know you can do it. It's Easter, and wouldn't this be a great time? Word spread of Natalie's condition. Churches in eight states were praying for a miracle that Easter morning when Natalie's sister called Dwayne from the hospital room. And she, she said, would you like to have some good news? And she said Natalie had woke up. And uh, immediately we, we, were just, we were just ecstatic with joy. And so we sang Amazing Grace around her bedside and tear, uh, tears running down Natalie's cheek. But that was, that was the, pretty much all the response we had, but it gave us hope. Despite the doctor's grim prognosis, Natalie quickly improved. 10 days later, she was transported to a rehabilitation facility under the care of Dr. Edgardo Diaz. When Natalie came, she was in a very uh, bad situation. She was confused, she was not oriented, she was not eating by herself, she had a feeding tube. Uh, essentially, she was uh, what we call total care. We had to do everything for her. 
Natalie began the slow process of rehabilitation. It was May, and the doctors expected her to spend Christmas in the rehab hospital. To everyone's surprise, she walked out six weeks later. All this trauma and the way she came and the way she left, I was very pleased too that she made that good recovery in what I consider a short period of time. God is an in intensely powerful God. What was gonna take me many months or even over a year to do, God did through me in just a matter of weeks. He can heal the blind. He can raise the dead. He can do whatever it is that He wants or needs to do or in His will. The miracles that He worked in my life, it didn't stop when He woke me up. First they said I would never wake up and I did. Then they said I would be a lifetime quadriplegic. They needed to just put me in a nursing home. They said it would take 12 to 18 months for me to be anywhere near ready to go home. And in six weeks I walked out. So God was in control the whole time. Duane says since 2003, they've celebrated Easter for two reasons. It's when our Lord rose on that third day, but it's also the day Natalie rose from the dead too, I believe. A miracle was performed that day and uh, I just have to give God the, cl the glory. What an incredible story. You know, way back in Exodus, uh, chapter 15, God says, I am the Lord who heals you. He is our healer. He is our source, our strength. It's amazing the power of prayer, isn't it? Um, I'm sure that, you know, if you've been on this planet for any amount of time, you've had to see some crisis, sometimes in someone else's family. And I know that what happens in the group that I circle with, if someone's in trouble, we send out a prayer request and we all start praying. Uh, we've even seen it on the show. I remember one time, um, you know, Brian had a real frog in his throat and he sent out the prayer request to everybody and we were all believing that he was gonna be able to, you know, get through the day and God healed him. He healed him on the spot. Do we believe in prayer we do we live this we breathe it we know that our God is a a God who answers prayers and whether it's a crisis in the moment like Natalie faced or whether you're dealing with a, a long-standing disease or illness sometimes we get so used to being sick uh, you know sometimes we have so many headaches we don't even pray about it anymore we just reach for a pill bottle but God is a God who answers our prayers and if we would give our stuff to him he is faithful to answer that which we ask for would you like to uh, give us a call one 855 there are prayer partners standing by and it doesn't cost you a thing you just give us a call and we will give you some inspiration from the word of God that will inspire you to know that God Here's your prayers and he will answer. Well, don't go anywhere because coming right up, Brian's got a special Easter hope to go. You don't want to miss it. Welcome to this Hope To Go. Today I want to talk to you about Big Finish. And also, welcome to this Good Friday Hope To Go edition. You know, author Max Licato, and no wonder they call him a savior, writes about Good Friday. Like a master painter, God reserved his masterpiece until the end. All the earlier acts of love had been leading to this one moment. God unveils the canvas and the ultimate act of creative compassion is revealed. Wow, the cross, it rests on the timeline of history like a compelling diamond. Its tragedy summons all sufferers, its absurdity attracts all critics, its hope allures and lures all searchers. The cross, history has idolized it, despised it, gold-plated it and burned it, worn it and trashed it. History has done everything to it but ignore it. That's one option that the cross does not offer. No one can ignore it. You can't ignore a piece of lumber that suspends the greatest claim in history, a crucified carpenter claiming that he is God on earth. The cross, 
It's the bottom line, and it's a sobering account of the true history of all humanity, period. On this first Good Friday, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, the original Hebrew Aramaic name of Jesus, meaning the anointed one, while hanging on the cross, uttered some of the most powerful words ever spoken. You see, the cross meant death to Jesus, but to all who by faith believe in Jesus, the cross has become a tree of life. Let's feed on these last seven words of the cross together today by faith. The first word of the cross is, Father, forgive them. Not just once, but over and over. And it says, there is forgiveness for you at the cross. Today, you will be with me in paradise. There is salvation for you at the cross. Oh, I love the third word. Word, woman, here is your son. There's love for you at the cross. My God, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? There's atonement for you at the cross. I thirst. Jesus suffered for you at the cross. It is finished. Jesus was and remains the victor over sin for you at the cross. And finally, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. There's eternal security for you at the cross. As we wrap up this hope to go, I want us to circle back and end focusing on the fourth word from the cross, the word of trust. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. Isn't it amazing that sometimes it appears that when you are following God, it can often appear that you're in more of a mess than when you before decided to follow God's will. God's purpose and God's plan. Every now and then, we can feel like we are all by ourselves. Now, we must recognize that when David says in Psalms 22 and 1, why hast thou forsaken me? He's not talking about the absence of the presence of God. He's talking about the activity of God. When he says, God, you are forsaking me, the spirit of the text suggests that he is confessing that, God, you're ignoring me. It's not that you're not here because you're omnipresent, you're everywhere, but you, God, are ignoring me. And the reason that I feel that you're ignoring me is because I don't see anything outwardly happening on my behalf. Here in the war between the flesh and the spirit, what David emotionally felt Christ Jesus, the author of life, is actually experiencing for the sin of the whole world. Just as a scapegoat of the Old Testament had to be banished into the wilderness, so Jesus had to bear the sin of the world alone, literally God forsaken. That for you and that for me to be eternally free. And this disturbing word from the cross of Calvary, it is Jesus experiencing complete humiliation. It has been said that Christ's self-emptying was not a single act of bereavement, but a growing poor and poor until at last nothing was left to him but a piece of ground where he could weep and a cross where he could die. Abraham Kuyper, Prime Minister of the Netherlands between 1901 and 1905 wrote that. How Jesus felt as his loud cry broke that dreadful silence of that moment of destiny, we can only imagine. But Jesus willingly did it for you and for me. This word from the cross points us to the cost of atonement at one with God. Today, the takeaway is very simple. For your big finish, thank God for Jesus. The atonement for sin at the cross, it's been done. Tetelestai, it is finished. Receive it by faith and live thankful. It's something we must never lose sight of. And that's your hope to go. Jesus said it. I came to give you life. Life to the fullest. Life in your family. Life in your finances. Life in your body, mind, and spirit. Life in your every day. We're here to help you discover life. Welcome back. We're excited to offer you our latest premium called Answered Prayer. How to pray effectively to see God work in your life. Mm, in this latest DVD, Pat Robertson answers questions that you have regarding prayer and seeing them answered. 
All you need to do is become a monthly 700 Club Canada partner, and it's our gift to you for joining. Mm. If you want to experience a new level of faith, you'll want to get this DVD into your hands, Answered Prayer. You too can see dramatic answers to your prayers. It would be such an encouragement if you'd call right now, and we'll send it to you immediately. The number is 1-855-759-0700. Mm -hmm. Prayer partners are standing by. And we want to pray for you as well. This weekend, we have the power of prayer because of what he has done, but because he lives. Mm -hmm. Would you put Kathy uh, from Burns Lake on your prayer, prayer list? She wants relief for her daughter, Chelsea, and her two-year-old son. And Tanya from Bonneville, Alberta, needs friends after the death of her parents. Why don't you start that off? Yeah. Mm. Father, we just bring Tanya before you, Lord. You mm. understand, oh God, loneliness. You understand, Father, the loss that Tanya has been through. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would just become a comforter and a friend, mm. that you would literally inhabit her home, that you would be with her. Please, Lord. You'd walk with her, God. You'd be in the car with her. You'd bless her. Give her comfort in this time of grief, and we trust you for this in Jesus' name. And Father, we, we thank you for, for Chelsea, and we thank you, Lord, for the prayers of a mother for her child and for her grandson. And we believe you even now as we touch and agree for the full completion and also the full blessing of that family mm -hmm. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, when we look at Good Friday, uh, yeah. what's your what's your favorite memory? Mm. Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Well, you know, uh, we used to have the Good Friday service, of course, when I was mm -hmm. growing up. You know, not everyone does that these days, but yeah. uh, we always did, and it was, uh, you know, just to celebrate and to see that he was paying that price. But I remember they'd always say, you know, it might be Friday. But yeah. Sunday's coming. Sunday's coming. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite verses is Isaiah 53, verse 8. And it says, and who will declare his genealogy, his generation? We are son type positive. That's our blood type. And mm -hmm. because of that, we're his family because he lives. This Sunday, make sure you go to church and mm -hmm. God bless you. Yes, and we'll leave you with this verse in Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live now, in the body I live by faith, in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Mm, see you next time. God bless. Now there are more ways to connect with the 700 Club Canada online. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash 700 Club Canada. Find us on Instagram at 700 Club Canada or follow us on Twitter at 700 Club Canada. Just email cba at 700club.ca or visit us at 700club.ca. On the next 700 Club Canada. Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? So you're the one. I am he 